Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. So what is your preferred regimen in uh, treating first line um, ER, PR positive disease? Treatment of ER positive disease is complicated and depends on a number of different factors. One would be the duration of disease-free interval from the original diagnosis. Second would be disease burden, visceral predominant versus uh, less uh, non-visceral predominant. So for example, a patient with lymph node soft tissue, perhaps pleural or bone metastatic disease would be treated completely different from a patient with highly proliferative, liver predominant, extensive visceral disease. Uh, so in a patient such as the latter patient, um, one would use chemotherapy up front to try to control the extensive burden of disease that the patient has. Uh, and often would use two agents together to get a, a rapid response in a patient who is very symptomatic. In a, in a patient who is much less symptomatic with much more limited burden of disease, one would approach that patient with endocrine therapy for as long as humanly possible. How about the role of aromatase inhibitors in that setting? Well, uh, currently, uh, aromatase inhibitor therapy would be frontline therapy. Um, it kind of depends on where the patient is. Did the patient relapse on an aromatase inhibitor, for example? In that setting, one would assume that they have endocrine-resistant disease, and then one would use an everolimus-containing regimen. But for a patient who relapsed after a period of time off of an aromatase inhibitor, one could come back in with an aromatase inhibitor, particularly if the patient had tolerated therapy well. How about estrogen receptor positive disease? What do you typically use in the first line setting? Uh, it's interesting. It really depends um, on whether they, the vast majority of women who present with ER positive metastatic breast cancer will also have bone metastases. So they'll need some sort of bone agent to kind of protect the bone, prevent fracture and other skeletal related events. And I'll either use uh, zolantronic acid or more and more frequently denosumab. Um, I use a lot of denosumab because it's easy to give. It's a shot. You don't have to put an infusion. You don't have to start an IV. Um, I'm not 100% convinced it's really that much better uh, than zolantronic acid um, in terms of efficacy. I mean, there is data that suggests that it is about, you know, reduces uh, skeletal related events probably by about 20%. But on the other hand, clinically, in, you know, whether that's clinically relevant to the vast majority of people, I'm not sure. But it is clearly more convenient. It's easier to give the patients like it. There's no real side effects with denosumab, the only one being probably hypocalcemia um, in a certain number of people. And, you know, a little bit, we just tell people to kind of be careful about their teeth, that if they need an extraction, uh, we tell them just to let us know so we can hold the denosumab. And with those sort of things, you don't get osteonecrosis of the jaw or anything like that. So generally, I use a bone protective agent if they have bone metastases. Um, generally, it will really depend on what they've had before. The vast majority of people who come in with ER-positive metastatic breast cancer will have had an adjuvant regimen, and sometimes they'll still be on their adjuvant regimen. So if I have a postmenopausal woman who's already on an aromatase inhibitor, you know, I'll think about things like fulvestrant, uh, if they've been, or tamoxifen. Um, if they have not been on an aromatase inhibitor, I'll probably put them on that. Um, and most of them are generic right now, and I'll usually start with a non-steroidal, such as an astrazole or letrozole. Um, if they've been on, uh, if they're post-premenopausal, the first thing I almost always do if they haven't uh, had their estrogen suppressed is I do that first, either through an LHRH agonist or oophorectomy. Um, and whether I, give an, whether I give an aromatase inhibitor with that, I don't know. I think there's some intriguing data, at least in the adjuvant setting, that we're going to see tomorrow or Monday in the plenary session of ASCO uh, that may or may not change that. Um, but I think that uh, uh, that's kind of how I usually, usually do my first line regimens. Let's talk a little bit more about aromatase inhibitors. When do you incorporate them in estrogen, estrogen receptor positive metastatic breast cancer? Well, aromatase inhibitors are very widely used for ER positive metastatic disease. They're probably our first drug of choice, uh, with the exception being only women who have already had an aromatase inhibitor in the adjuvant setting or who are immediately coming off of an aromatase inhibitor for early stage breast cancer. They're great drugs. They're very effective. They're easy to take. They have side effects, uh, hot flashes, night sweats, bone and joint stiffness. But for 
for most women with advanced breast cancer, those are relatively minor side effects in the context of how effective the drugs could be. And they've become the backbone of choice for a lot of exciting drug discovery that's going on in ER-positive metastatic disease. So exemestane and an aromatase inhibitor commercially available is the uh, backbone onto which Everolimus, which is the mTOR inhibitor, uh, has been approved for in um, uh, endocrine-resistant breast cancer. Uh, there's a lot of work going on right now with a new class of drugs called CDK4-6 inhibitors, which are being studied in combination with aromatase inhibitors. So they're a very widely used first and second line treatment option.